Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this, the first webinar in our Soil to the Sea series of environmental webinars. You're very welcome to this morning's webinar, and I hope you've got your, your cup of tea or your biscuits beside you. And uh, as we wait on a few more people coming in, I'll just briefly introduce um, the, the series of webinars and then today's webinar specifically. So in AFBI, one of our key themes is to enhance our natural and marine environments, which are, of course, interconnected. AFBI is often aligned with the agri-food industry, but it also has a very strong body of environmental and marine scientists. In Northern Ireland, we do focus a lot on livestock and land use. And while livestock farming and agriculture often is considered quite far from the sea, with Northern Ireland being a small geographical region, as well as on an island, all roads lead to the sea. As such, farming and agriculture practices are more intrinsically linked to the land, inland waterways, our coast, and then the marine environments than we may realise. Equally, the sustainable management of healthy aquatic systems, whether inland or at sea, bode well for Northern Ireland's natural capita and overall ability to be sustainable. In AFBI, we're very fortunate to have a large number of expert scientists across a broad range of disciplines working on our unique platforms. These platforms span instrumented landscapes on the research farm at Hillsborough, a number of catchments across Northern Ireland. We have continuous monitoring of key rivers and lakes in Northern Ireland, as well as monitoring stations on our coasts. And last, but by no means least, the research vessel cruising the Irish Sea right up to the North Atlantic Shelf. Using this vast array of capability from soil right to the sea, AFBI can deliver a uniquely joined up picture of how agriculture interacts with the land and water and the sea. And indeed, many of, there's many learnings for, to be made by the agri-food industry from the models which are currently being established to build sustainable fishing practices. Such modelling is building, as I would call it, a safe operating space for fishing. And this is something which needs to be established for agriculture in Northern Ireland. So there's lessons to be learned. Over the coming three weeks, the excellent science being delivered by AFBI's environmental and marine science teams will be showcased for you. Today, we will focus on soil to catchment management of agricultural nutrients. This will be led by Dr. Don Hadoudi, who has a vast knowledge of the flow of nutrients from agriculture, especially phosphorus, to our waterways. Dr. Suzanne Higgins and Dr. Rachel Cassidy will also be presenting, and they both have much expertise in soil management. Next week's webinar will then focus on the impacts of the environment, nutrient loading, and other human pressures on the ecology and life in our rivers and lakes. In the third webinar the following week, we will present some scientific findings on where the land meets the sea. And we will be discussing, um, in particular, AFBI's work towards a holistic approach for the sustainable management of the marine environment and natural resources. But back to today, after each presentation, I, from Danaha, Suzanne and Rachel, we'll take some questions. And if I can just take you down to the bottom right hand side of your screen, if you're not familiar with WebEx, there's a Q&A button. And if you press that Q&A button, that should allow you to type in your question and submit it. By using that Q&A button, we will be able to see your questions. And as we go through this morning's webinar, I will take as many questions as I can. And as I say, we will take questions after each of the presentations. So please do be typing as the presenters go through. And we'll take a few minutes to ask your questions specific to the presentation. However, at the very end of the, the presentations, we'll also have a short panel session. And Chris Johnson and John Bailey will join the presenters, Donna, Rachel and Suzanne, in that panel session. So keep typing those questions and keep them coming through. But with no further ado, I'd now like to hand over to Donna, who, who's going to start our presentations this morning on managing the risk of phosphorus loss from slurry application. Thank you, Donna. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Elizabeth, um, for the introduction. Um, 
This morning, I am going to talk about managing the risk of phosphorus loss from slurry application. And this work arises out of a DARA funded ENI project that finished earlier this year. To start with, I just want to um, acknowledge my collaborators on this. Um, Russell Adams and Anya Anderson um, from AFPI, um, Pete, Pete Fadez from the USDA in, in America, Owen Fenton and Pat Tuhi from Chagas. We're all aware of the uh, different water quality issues that are, occur, that, that are happening here in Northern Ireland. And we have a range of different issues related to sediment, related to um, nutrients, or related to a range of different contaminants getting into our water bodies. And for the, the water, water framework director for its replacement, um, at the moment we're, we, there's 40 different elements that are tested, um, and it's a one all out all system. Um, it's a and it's on a pass fail basis. And we have seen between 2015, we have seen improvements in in DO, pH, macrophytes, invertebrates. We've also seen um, uh, changes in our water quality, negative changes in our water quality around fish, diatoms, and, and morphology, and in particular around um, phosphorus, around soluble reactive phosphorus. We've seen a nearly an eight percent decline in the number of water bodies, or increase, sorry, in the no number of water bodies that are failing the, to achieve good status due to the um, due to SRP. And, um, you know, it's fair to say, I think in the last 20, 30 years, we've made significant improvements in our nutrient management in Northern Ireland. And if you look at the um, uh, figure A here, you can see the nutrient uh, surplus in Northern Ireland has come right down from you know, a high of around 20 kilograms of P per hectare, right down to about um, 8 kilograms of P per hectare in 2008. However, since that time, we have seen a, an increase in our in our uh, P surplus in Northern Ireland, and it's creeped back up to about 10 uh, sorry, 12 kilograms of P per hectare. And that's kind of been reflected and mirrored by changes in water quality. And since around 2010, 2011, we've seen the phosphorus concentration in our rivers going, uh, going back up um, on, a, on a national level. And if you look at it kind of nationally, we're losing about 940 tons of agricultural peat water. And that's a figure we calculated for 2017. And that's meaning that about 61% of our water bodies are above the, the target required to achieve good status. So where is all that phosphorus coming from? Now, I don't expect you to be able to see all the detail of this graph, but I just want to highlight that when we have produced a substance flow analysis um, for the whole of the Northern Ireland food system, looking at the stocks and flows of, of phosphorus throughout the system, and this is for 2017. And you can see that that, that, that graph and that figure is dominated by the um, by the top half of the, the figure. Now, each of the black lines that you see here represents a flow of phosphorus. And the thicker the line, the more phosphorus that's flowing um, from, from one component to another. And if we focus in on the top half of that, of that figure, you can see that the, 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 the top black line here, um, the manure to fields, dominates the majority of the flow um, of phosphorus. And in fact, we have about 20,400 tons of phosphorus um, that's being moving from livestock to to um, to our fields, and overall we have a in the whole of the food system we have about a ten thousand three hundred ton um, surplus of phosphorus in the in our in our system, and the majority of that is um, being is accumulating in our soils. In fact, seven thousand three hundred tons of our phosphorus is accumulating up in our soils, and and will have an impact on water quality into the future. And this is just for for two thousand seventeen on, on a one year basis. So we have a surplus of phosphorus in Northern Ireland, and even if we are to this, this graph shows that all the all the townlands in in Northern Ireland, and it shows the deficits in surplus. If we could uh, move our slurry and our phosphorus within that slurry everywhere with no no logistical constraints um, or economic constraints, and apply it only to suitable uh, suitable agricultural land, we would still have fifty four percent of our um, townlands will be in surplus in terms of the amount of slurry needed by plants. So there's a big issue there in terms of what we do with that surplus. You'll all, you'll all be aware of the Nutrient Action Programme and it's new, the new addition out in the Nutrient Action Programme 2019. I'm sure you're aware of the, all the restrictions that have been already placed and that are placed on slurry application and the, the close period running from the 15th of October to the 30th, um, 31st of January. But there's also restrictions about when farmers can apply slurry. They can't apply in waterlogged soils. And just to highlight what waterlogged soils is defined as in the nitrate threat or the nutrient action program is if you put pressure on that soil, does water bond to the surface? 
We also have restrictions around heavy rainfall, which is four millimeters per hour within uh, 24 hours, I'm sorry, 48 hours, and also setback distances from water courses and, and a, a minimal, a, a maximum application rate of 50 cubic meters per hectare. But on top of all of that, there's other considerations I suppose the farmers need to, um, to need to keep in mind when they're deciding when to spread slurry and not to spread slurry. And um, what's their current storage capacity? When will it be the next opportunity to spread? When will the next contractor be available to spread my slurry? So these are all kind of complex issues that farmers need to, to take into consideration. And they're doing that within an environment that is inherently risky. If you if you classify Northern Ireland soils um, based on the UK hydro hydrology of soil type classification, 58% of our soils could be classed as high runoff potential, while another 31% would be medium runoff potential. Now, that's not to say that, that, that overland flow and runoff occurs um, every day or, or every in, in every location. It just says that they are risky in terms of runoff. So it's a, a difficult challenge and that, that farmers have in identifying the right place to, where to spread slurry. Also need to think about the temporal variability and how that affects risk. Um, you're looking at two graphs here. The top graph is so much a deficit. The bottom graph is um, mil uh, um, rainfall, one millimeter rainfall per day. Now, just to explain so much the deficit. So, so much the deficit of zero is field capacity. Um, a, anything going from zero to minus five to minus 10 is the soil's getting wetter and minus 10 being fully saturated. Anything going from plus five up to plus 10, 20, the soil is getting drier. Now, ideally, we want farmers spreading slurry around field capacity or drier. We want about plus five, plus 10. So, what this graph at the top shows is the percent number of days per month. Um, that the soils um, are at field capacity. Now, this is for a 10 year, this is the average for a 10 year data set from the Hillsborough site, um, Athby Hillsborough site. And for example, you can see in January, just 3% of our days would hit that criteria um, of zero millimeters soil moisture deficit. While in June, you have up to over 90% um, achieving that, that threshold. But the interesting thing from this graph for me is the variability that farmers have to deal with here. In terms of even in June, you could have um, as low as 30 days, or in July, you could have low as 20 days from this data set, 20 days that are suitable for slurry spreading. And so there's significant variability in the soil moisture conditions um, over time. And on top of that, and we all know this, there's a lot of rainfall in, 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 in Northern Ireland. And on average, if you're looking at a, a one millimeter per day um, rainfall, you, you get rainfall on about 30 to 40 percent of, um, of, of the days throughout the year. So within that complex um, and, and inherently risky environment, how well do, do the current NAP regs mitigate the risk of PLOS due to slurry application in Northern, Northern Ireland? And to address this question, we use a model called SURFACE. It's surface phosphorus runoff model. And it only looks at losses in overland flow. It's a model that was developed by the USDA in America. And what the model looks for as inputs, it looks for daily rainfall values. You, you also feed in daily runoff values and temperature. And we had this information for you know, our own sites at um, Athby Hillsborough. We also got data from Chagas, from Moor Park, and Johnson Castle. And what the model allows us to do is allows us to simulate different timings and different rates of applications, um, peak content um, of uh, slurry, or different field conditions under applications. And what comes out the other side of the, of the model is a, a, a value of SRP, soluble reactive phosphorus, in terms of kilograms per hectare per year. I just want to, before I move on to graphs here, I just want to explain what you're looking at here. What the model does is it, it, it takes May the 1st and it applies slurry on May the 1st. It then looks at how much, due to the application, how much phosphorus will be lost in the following days um, from May the 1st. And then it accumulates that um, as the P loss for May the 1st. It then comes back and it does the same for May the 2nd. And it does the same for May the 3rd. And it does it for every day of the year. So what you're looking at is the cumulative P loss for one particular day. And this is what the, the graphs look like when you uh, from from surface. Um, what you're looking at here is the black line, which is if we have no restrictions for slurry spreading in Northern Ireland, what sort of uh, P loss would we, we we record on each day? And then the red line is when we apply the NAP regulations um, um, to the to the data. This is for a four year data set from Hillsborough and County Down. Um, and what I want to draw your attention to first is the table on the bottom um, of the graph in the far right hand uh, column, which says the difference between 
overland flow, sorry, the difference between the open period and the closed period. And that figure of 60% uh, indicates that there's 60, there's 60 percent on average, there's 60 percent more phosphorus loss during the closed period. If we were allowed to spread slurry in the closed period, there would be 60 percent more phosphorus loss during the closed period than in the open period. Then I want to draw your attention to the column that's entitled open period. And you can see that shows the, the difference the, the NAP regulations is having um, during the open period. And it's, it suggests that on average, there's a 24 percent reduction in soluble reactive P export um, during the open period as a result of the NAP regulations. So that would indicate, those two figures would indicate to us that the NAP, NAP regulations are having a, an impact and are making a difference in terms of re reducing the risk um, of P loss as a result of slurry application. But what else can we do? What other steps could we take to reduce? Because clearly with the, the trends that we have in, at the moment in terms of phosphorus concentration in our rivers and that upward trend, um, we need to maybe take further steps. So what other options can we look at? Well, there's a range of ones we can look at in terms of spatial targeting, make sure we're targeting at the right place. We also can look at timings of application and making the timings of application stricter to make sure it's been applied at the right time. Then you have you can look at changes in phosphorus um, content of slurry, the different application rates, and also possibly a longer close period. So what differences do those different additional measures make? So this particular um, graph um, is again an output from the surface model, but it's for a one-year data from Moore Park and County Cork. And what this data, what Moore, Moore Park allowed us to do here was that they had different drainage classifications for soils at that site. So they had poorly drained soils, which is, is the red line, moderately drained soils, the black line, and the well-drained soils, which is the green line. And you can see from this, there's a significant difference if you target your applications at well-drained soils rather than at poorly drained soils. In fact, you're going from 0.28 kilograms of P per hectare right down to, in the well-drained soils, right down to 0.03 kilograms of P per hectare per year. There's a significant difference. So we can target at the right place, we will make a difference. I also want to draw your attention here just today to the difference in the pattern of export um, during the um, during the close period. In the previous graph I showed you for Hillsborough, a lot of the P was happening, P loss was happening or would have happened around November, December. In this particular graph, it's happening around January. So timings of application. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, farmers currently, the kind of threshold the farmers are, are told to use in terms of deciding whether soil is suitable for slurry application or not, is if they put pressure on it, do they see water rising to the surface? But however, if we had a tighter restriction on that, if we said that there was, we limited applications to drier soils, so zero millimeters and so much a deficit or greater, um, what impact that would, would that have? Well, in the open period, you would reduce P loss, um, uh, soluble reactive P loss by 44%. In the closed period, you reduce it by 83%. Now that looks like an, a, an a really impressive figure, 83% reduction. But in fact, only 8% of the days in, um, in the closed period would reach that threshold of greater than zero millimeters soil moisture deficit. So the 83% the, the 80, reduction is due to the limited number of days rather than the risk during the closed period. And you know, there's, a bit, there's, all, there's a lot of talk in Northern Ireland about reducing the, the, the PV content in, uh, being fed to our animals. And your know, work has been done around this in, in terms of um, Conrad Ferris's work on low pea diets and uh, Sharon O'Rourke's work then looking at the pea content of the slurry. And then we looked at this model, this at field scale, and we found if you if you reduce the pea content by 10%, you'd get a similar reduction in the pea loss at field scale. Um, and if you reduce it by 30%, you'd get a similar pea loss again in reduction in pea loss from field scale. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting here for a moment whether um, a 30% reduction in slurry is, is achievable or not, but it's just to show that we can keep the peak content of our, um, of, of our slurry down as low as possible, then we can see benefits in terms of how much we're losing um, from soil to water. So application rates is something that we've already um, looked at in Northern Ireland. If you look at the new restrictions around February, where we reduce the maximum application rate um, from 50 cubic meters per hectare, right down to 30 cubic meters per hectare, and that has made a difference. You know, from this particular data set, you know, if you're applying at 50 cubic meters per hectare, you're losing 0.17 kilograms of um, P per hectare per year. 
what you, you, you apply the 30 uh, cubic meters back there, you get a 53% reduction. Now, if we can reduce our application rates even further on high risk soils, um, you can see further benefits in the reduction. And even down to 10 cubic meters per hectare, you would see an 80% reduction in the phosphorus that will be lost in those soils if we could reduce or keep our control over our application rates. So originally when the, the nitrates action program was put together in 2005, and the evidence base that was presented to that point suggested that we should have a closed period running from the 1st of October to the end of February. Now, during negotiations with stakeholders and also with the, the EU, that was reduced to the 15th of October um, to the end of January. That's the current closed period. Now, but we, we wanted to look at, well, if the, the current closed period was extended out to the 1st of October to the end of February, what difference would that make? Well, it would reduce P loss by a further 14% um, if we included January, if we included February within the, the close period. So there would be some benefits in that um, going forward. However, we also looked at, well, how about if we shorten the close period? How about if we included January within the close period? What difference would that make? Um, now, we found that when you include, included January within the close period, I'm sorry, it was included January within the open period, um, that we found that there was a roughly a four to five percent increase in, in SRP, average SRP export. The reason for that, again, is because very few days in January are suitable for storage burning. But if we can if we can identify those days, um, we can minimize nutrient export during January. But the challenge is identifying the right days because there's very few of them there available in, in January. So what are the key take-home messages from my presentation? Well, firstly, I think it's very clear, and we probably all know this already, slurry spreading is an inherently risky practice. And there's a lot of things for farmers to consider and think about when they're going out to spread slurry. But the NAP regulations are making a difference at the moment. But to take that extra step and to, to you know, to change the current trajectory of, of our phosphorus in our, in our water bodies, we need to, to really push home this message of right time, right place. And to do that, we need to supply farmers with high resolution data, whether it be rainfall data on a, on a, on a one kilometer basis, or if we are or, or field scale soil moisture data, so they have the information to make the right decisions. Because the reality is we only have to lose a very small percentage of our, our phosphorus that's applied um, as in, in, in Surrey to water for there to be a problem. In fact, around 5%, if we lose about 5% of our phosphorus to water, we will have an impact on, on water quality. And the other big issue that we need to address going forward is to, um, if we want to reduce losses of water, is how much P we're actually applying in slurry. Um, so we need to look at different mitigation strategies for reducing the amount of P in slurry um, so that we can reduce losses to the environment. Thank you for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Donaha, very much. Um, so the first question we have in here, Donaha, for yourself is, would slurry separation help reduce P losses? Now, before you answer that, I'm going to just remind folk about the question and answer function down at the bottom right hand side of the screen. So folks, please do use it. Um, you're, you're quite shy this morning. So please, um, you know, get, get used to it and, and get those questions coming in. So Donna, first question, would slurry separation help reduce P losses? And it, yes, it would, because there would be less slurry being applied to our fields in Northern Ireland if we could shift um, slurry, the processed slurry, and move it um, elsewhere and use it for other new fertilizer products or export it out of Northern Ireland. The you know, work that we did for the Refocus project would suggest that if we could process around 30% of our slurry and export or, or, or not apply um, about 30% of our slurry um, to our fields, we would be getting down to a, 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 a pea surplus of around you know, one to three kilograms of P per hectare. And that would be far more sustainable if we could do that. So yes, P export would be a very valuable mitigation measure. Okay, thank you. And and Chris Johnson, I'm gonna maybe bring you in here. Would you have anything to add to that, just on the practicalities of separation? Well, yeah, um, I think probably to add to that, yeah, this, we know the separation will indeed reduce uh, the, the, the solids within the slurry itself, but only to a degree. Um, there's still a fairly high, well, that's if we're using screw press separators, which is probably the most likely technology to see on farms in Northern Ireland. Other technologies like centrifuges would do an awful lot of a better job in removing more phosphorus. 
I think possibly the question is, will it remove enough phosphorus from that slurry to make as big a difference as what Dominic is talking about? And I think probably at this extent, maybe it won't, but it depends on the intensity of the farm. OK, thank you. And, and, and great to see the questions coming in now. Um, we'll maybe come back to some of them at the end as well, just in the panel session. But Donna, maybe just back specifically to your presentation for now. Um, with regards to your modelling around the close period, um, did you look at you know, if the close period started later into November and what the impact of that might be? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> I don't have figures um, available on that, um, um, Elizabeth, but you can see from the, um, it depends on the site. Some, in some cases, in some years, November is, is better than January in terms of, um, or October is better than January. But you, you're talking roughly the same losses, like you will increase it by four to five percent, whether it's November or whether it's, um, whether it's, it's, in, it's, it's in January. The only benefits around October and November is possibly so much the deficit isn't as high. Um, during October and November. But again, it's uh, just to repeat that message, it's about being able to identify those times during October or November that are suitable for spreading. And that's the big challenge for farmers under the current situation. Sure. A couple of questions coming in here with regards to slurry application. So does application make, method make a difference? And I'm going to wrap a couple into, into, uh, into a question here, so bear with me. So it's about, does application make, method make a difference? Is less spreading technologies beneficial or not? Um, and, and you know what's the impact and interaction then with soils that are maybe um, free draining or you know well drained or otherwise? Can you maybe just comment around slurry so, application and, and soil type? Well, so firstly, just to deal with the the equipment, uh, the, the the method of application. Yes, it does have an impact. Um, research has shown that. If you reduce with a um, low emission uh, spreading techniques, you can reduce phosphorus export um, to, from fields. The other, the other element of that that's important to consider is that with stuff like trailing shoe, you can it gives you a bigger window of opportunity to apply slurry um, after silage um, silage cutting. And work by Debbie McConnell showed that you can significantly reduce um, P loss from our fields if you can apply at a higher um, grass growth um, level. Um, the so one the one caveat on all that is that we with um with uh trailing shoe we have shown that on sloping ground and you know only six seven percent of uh in terms of slope you can increase um p loss if you apply with a trailing shoe um if you if it's so it should be done across the contours if it's safe to do so it should be done not down the slope because then you create channels that basically the, the slurry runs off down through those channels and out of your field so it needs to be done across the contours and in terms of soil type, I'm not 100% clear of the question on this, but I suppose the key thing is that if we can apply to free draining soils, we can, there's some mitigation of the P in terms of as it's drained, as it's moving down through the soil, it will be taken up and locked up in the soil to some extent. There will still be some, there'll still be some loss due to um, drain flow, you know, artificial drainage and so forth. There's no doubt we'll still lose slurry even in free draining soils. You'll go in, phosphorus and nitrogen will go into our groundwater or maybe lost in, in, in a, um, in artificial drains, but we do reduce, we, we, there's better retention opportunities if it's actually infiltrating into the soil rather than just being directly lost um, from the surface. Okay, thanks Donna. Last question for you here. Um, okay, I think there's a, does the 54% of land in surplus P equate to soil indexes of four or more? If so, does that mean slurry can, will, can be applied under the NAP? The 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 fifty four percent is considering what land is suitable, not what land we wouldn't have the, the data to say what land is at at, at high soil P. Um, now the that has to be factored into that equation. That you really ideally we shouldn't be applying slurry to fields that are already at index four or index three. And um, currently under the current NAPs NAP regs, and um, that that is possible. Um, the, and I um, from a logistical and from a farming perspective, I understand we you know it's clear why that has to be done. But from an environmental perspective, the application of slurry to um, soils that are index four, index um, three is is on is not necessary, and in increasing the risk in terms of water quality. Not sure is that directly answering the question, but I'm no, not. And, and I think we'll maybe pick up again on it and Rachel and Suzanne's presentation. But a yeah, yeah. question I, I wanted to ask you here, Donna, whenever my mouse started working again, there, <laughs> it's around. So, does the model consider where the phosphorus ends up when it is lost from the land? 
Is DOMA able to say how much ends up in the marine environment or does it get captured in freshwater ecosystems? That's a, that's a very good question. No, the, the model is only a field, an edge of field model. It says how much is actually moving out of the field and into a water body. It doesn't, it doesn't predict. To do that sort of modeling, we need to go up a level um, using, for example, a SWOT model um, or some other model that would allow us to predict. And this is something that has been done through Map Services Group with looking at you know, linking losses from the land right out to um, right out to coastal areas. So it is work that's been done in, in Appian. and I think that's been presented in the final session um, in in three in two weeks' time. That Matt or one of Matt's group might be presenting on that particular issue of, of losses. Okay, thank you, Donna, very much, and thank you, folks, for your questions. There, there's a good few that have come in there, which is excellent, and I will will bring them back into the discussion panel because some of them are cross cutting across the three presentations, as well as Chris and John being able to feed into the answers. But we're going to now move on to uh, Dr. Suzanne Higgins. Um, Suzanne's a soil scientist here in AFME. And today, Suzanne is going to tell us about refining the science behind fertilizer recommendations. Thank you, Suzanne. Hey, thank you, Elizabeth. Good morning, everyone. So my presentation, as Elizabeth said, is refining the science behind fertilizer recommendations. So in Northern Ireland, there are widespread inefficiencies in nutrient use on farms. And partly this is due to lack of regular soil testing. So as Dominica has spoken about, um, we have a huge problem with excessive soil phosphorus concentrations, and these are leading to nutrient loss into waterways. In addition to that, we have large areas which are suboptimum in soil pH, and we also have problems with soil deficiencies of potassium and sulfur, which are impacting on our silage production. The nutrient requirements um, vary between farm, farms depending on livestock numbers and type, nitrogen inputs and target yields and landscape factors. So in this presentation, I'll be talking about re-evaluating current fertilizer recommendations for Northern Ireland. I'll also be talking about tackling legacy soil P and targeted in-field management and new technology. So first of all, um, re-evaluating current fertilizer recommendations. So current fertilizer recommendations in Northern Ireland favor high production systems. So these are grasslands receiving high inputs of nitrogen from fertilizer and manure, totaling up to 360 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. These farms would have high target yields of 12 to 16 tons of dry matter per hectare per year. So in these high production systems, we are really referring to the big dairy farms and also our largest beef farms would also be operating at this intensity. However, much of Northern Ireland agriculture is not operating to this level. So we have a large um, area of extensively managed grassland in Northern Ireland where total nitrogen inputs are less than 60 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year and manure input would be less than 120 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. The expected yields of these farms would maybe be four to seven tons of dry matter per hectare per year and this is enough grass for those systems. So these would be um, largely, although not exclusively, beef and sheep farms they may have maybe only one or two cuts of silage per year, and many of them are part-time farmers. So this is a landscape that covers a large portion of the land area of Northern Ireland. We currently have minimal published data assessing the phosphorus requirements of these low input extensive systems. So to, according to Liebig's law of the minimum, the maximum yield is determined by the most limiting nutrient. So in an extensive system where the um, nitrogen input is low, the nitrogen input would be the limiting factor in terms of grass production. So in a low nitrogen input system, the maximum yield theoretically, you can see on the lower line on the graph, there theoretically would be around seven tons of dry matter per hectare per year. So even if you apply more phosphorus, on these farms, you're not going to get any more yield because nitrogen is the limiting factor. 
So where the nitrogen input is low, the phosphorus uptake by the grass and the phosphorus requirement is also lower. So on a farm where the input is 60 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year, theoretically, on the lower line of this graph, you could see that this would correlate to a awesome P index of one in the soil. This is the amount of phosphorus you need to attain that amount of grass. Whereas for a higher nitrogen input system, which would be a more intensive farm, a um, large dairy farm, where the yields are higher and you have a larger input of nitrogen at 90% of, of the maximum yield, this would correlate with an index of 2 plus phosphorus. And this is well established and is the basis of our fertilizer recommendations currently in the UK. Whereas um, we don't know the bottom line here, this is our theoretical. Um, what we think for an extensive grassland system where the nitrogen input is lower. So we are examining this, examining this over a three-year period. So we're looking at extensively managed grassland systems where the nitrogen inputs are 60 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year or less, and where nitrogen is the primary yield-limiting nutrient. So we hypothesize that these grass, grasslands require lower phosphorus inputs in order to optimize their grass yield for their system. This is compared to intensively grassland managed systems where you have nitrogen inputs in excess of 300 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. These would require higher phosphorus inputs and um, as would be stated in the current RB209 fertilizer recommendations for the UK. So in the UK, we, we measure soil P in terms of Olson P content of soil, and this is divided into an index. So in the current in the recent revision of the Nitrates Action Program and the phosphorus regulations, there was set a holding position where we are looking at these phosphorus recommendations and making um, a suggested revision whereby the index two, which is the agronomic optimum of um, phosphorus you need in your in soil for production. That this would be split into a lower band, um, a two minus, which would be more suitable for extensive grass and farms, and an upper band of index two, index two plus, which would be more um, suitable for intensively managed grassland. So we are looking at these recommendations currently using field trials, and they may be reevaluated and revised based on the results of our field work. So we currently have a large interreg project called Catchment Care, and this is offered in the Blackwater Catchment. So what we want to do is refine the current nutrient advice that's given to farmers. We are focusing on farm activity level and farm specific advice. And we have selected 17 farms in the Blackwater Catchment to look at this. So what we have is set up field trials in two grazed fields and a silage field. These, these are extensive farms. We're applying different rates of phosphorus and looking at the grass yield and the grass quality. So our early results show that in grazed fields, which have a low um, soil P content of index one, no grass P deficiency was detected even when no P was applied. So even when no more phosphorus applied, there was no phosphorus deficiency in the grass showing up. So we can say then that an awesome P index of one may be sufficient for grazed um, fields in an extensive system. However, I must stress that these results are provisional. We really need several years of consecutive data, different soil types, um, to look at whether this is sufficient phosphorus in the grass for animal requirements and also if the yields are sustainable for those systems we don't want we want to make sure the farms are sustainable on a low phosphorus input on the silage fields where there's slightly higher nitrogen inputs a higher soil p um, may be required so an index two minus um, recent literature from Belgium has supported this work, showing that the higher the N input, the greater the growth and demand for phosphorus also increases. And phosphorus deficiency tends to be more common where there's a high nitrogen input. 
So the next part of the presentation is about tackling legacy soil pea. So as Donica said, we have large areas of land in Northern Ireland which are oversupplied with phosphorus. So the target is to try and lower the percentage of the fields which are index three or above for phosphorus, and that's the right hand side of the red line on the graph. We want to increase the percentage of fields um, to the left of that line and which are at economic agronomic optimum for phosphorus rather than being excessive phosphorus. In this um, particular catchment, 66% of the fields we sampled were above the agronomic optimum for phosphorus. So by tackling legacy P, we mean by this that we are minimizing further inputs of P into those systems, either by fertilizer or slurry. Um, and then we're actually using the phosphorus that's stored in the soil rather than applying any further phosphorus. And this can take a very long time to reduce the phosphorus content of soil. So previous studies have demonstrated that it can take up to 13 years for an index four soil to decline to index two in a grazed system. And it can take eight years in a silage system if no further P is applied. But we need different, we need further studies on this, looking at different systems with different amount of nitrogen applied, different grass species, and different soil types. It's very important to maintain uh, the demand for readily available pea in the soil um, for in terms of supporting grass growth and also for animal health. So what we want to do is reduce the amount of pea we're putting into the system, but we still want to have enough pea there to meet the demand, especially in springtime in silage systems and um, for six, three, four silage cuts. There can be a very um, rapid period of growth in the spring, and we need to make sure there's enough phosphorus in the soil solution to meet that demand for growth. So phosphorus in soil exists in um, three main fractions. So there's phosphorus in the soil solution, which is actually quite a small amount. Then you have phosphorus on exchange sites on the particle surfaces of the soil. And then you have a huge store of phosphorus which is locked up within the soil aggregates themselves. And these are very slowly released over a long period of time. So we want to make sure there's enough phosphorus in the soil solution to meet immediate plant demand. And with phosphorus, this soil solution P is mainly obtained through fertilizer applications. So fertilizer that is applied is, is generally readily available and the grass can take it up immediately. Whereas with slurry, when you apply slurry P, a large point um, proportion of that phosphorus is locked up with organic material and it's it's released more slowly over time so it might not be readily available for grass uptake. So we have been recently carrying out some greenhouse studies looking at the availability of phosphorus in slurry, different slurry types, digestate, separated slurry. The assumption is that 50% um, of phosphorus in slurry is readily available um, upon application and the rest is, is released more slowly over time. It may be released later in the year or the following year. This is compared to inorganic fertilizer where it assumed that when you apply fertilizer, that phosphorus is immediately available for uptake. So the slurry content of, of or the phosphorus content of slurry itself varies extremely widely. So even then, this graph shows 10 different farms, and this is the measure of the total P measured in, in the slurry. So between farms, the phosphorus content of the slurry varies very widely. And this depends on the livestock type, the P content of the, of the concentrates that the animals are fed, also slurry dry matter content. And this can vary even between batches of slurry from the same farm. And then when this is applied on the field as well, it is often not applied uniformly over the field. So you can have, um, it can create then variability in the field in the phosphorus content, depending on the way the slurry is applied. So the final part of this presentation is, is talking about targeted infield management and new technology. So when we soil sample fields, our fields are managed generally as uniform units. But research has shown there's substantial 
subfill variability in nutrients. So it's not only in phosphorus, there's also a huge variation across the field in potassium, magnesium, sulfur, and the availability of nitrogen um, in the soil pH. So subfield scale monitoring is very expensive and it's very um, it's currently too costly to implement. But new technology is presenting opportunities for management. So when we sample a field, generally it's one sample per one box sample per field, and it's sampled using a, a zigzag formation across the field. So you would get one soil value for that whole field. For our research is if you sample um, at multiple points in a field and have an individual nutrient value across that field, you can see that the nutrient content can vary significantly. And then you can map the nutrient content of the field. So the map on the right here is on soil phosphorus concentration across the field. And this, this field is, is extremely high in phosphorus, gone up to index six. So you can see where there are hot spots of phosphorus within a field. And then you can see, is there any risk of that phosphorus um, causing harm to waterways? So I have a very good um, PhD student working on this. And on the image on the left, this is a drone image, which um, she has managed to identify potential runoff pathways in that field. There's a river running along the bottom of the field. And we can then model this data to say how much of the phosphorus from those hot spots in the field could potentially be getting into that river. And um, we're also going to be looking at, this is from drone imagery, and um, we're going to be looking at LIDAR images as well to compare the, the types of, of imagery you can use. And this other second example here, you can see this field on the right, the soil phosphorus index is going from index zero, which is deficient, to index four, even within the same field. So really this farmer, should not apply any more phosphorus to the right-hand side of the field, but they could apply it to the left-hand side of the field. If that field was sampled in by um, standard techniques, there'd be only one sample for that whole field area, so it'll probably come out around index two. But you can see by sampling using a grid at multiple points across the field, you can see where there are hot spots in that field where you should avoid applying any more nutrients and then you can target your applications to a, a part of the field that needs it. So if we use drone imagery and other um, technology, sometimes you can see landscape factors that from above that you might not see in the field themselves. So we're, trying, we're looking at new technology and the benefits of this for, for aiding nutrient management. So many new tractors now are fitted with GPS technology. So this helps the farmer to navigate around the field so they could identify where they can apply nutrients and where they can't. It helps increase the precision of the nutrient management in their field. Um, GPS technology also gives a more even, helps a more even application because we have found that often um, slurry and fertilizer are not applied evenly. Sometimes there's multiple overlaps of certain parts of the field, creating hot spots and nutrients and other areas don't get as much. And then also, if there's multiple passes of certain areas of a field, it can um, result in soil compaction. So this using technology such as GPS steering on tractors, we can help improve our soil health and also the um, precision and um, precision of application or make it more optimal. So um, technology such as this, so a farmer could have either maps of their yield or maps of their nutrients on a screen, and then it can help them decide where to apply the nutrient. This can also be used for precision um, lime application. We've shown that soil pH varies widely in a field, so some areas may need more lime than others. And so um, we have at CL um, at Hillsborough, or CL Precision Grassland Platform at Affy Hillsborough, we have variable rate spreading technology for fertilizer and also slurry spreading. So AFI research is looking at the opportunities and potential benefits of this technology for Northern Ireland farmers for helping improve their nutrient management and minimizing the environmental impacts. 
So the conclusions to my presentation, um, AFBI research is seeking to evaluate new drip recommendations to ensure that they're appropriate for Northern Ireland soils and farm management regimes. Current fertilizer recommendations may need to be refined in order to better meet the needs of extensively managed grassland. And new technology presents opportunities for increasing the precision of nutrient inputs, helping minimize surfaces, correcting deficiencies, and reducing the environmental impact. Okay, so thank you. I'm going to hand back to Elizabeth now. If anybody has any questions. Thank you, Suzanne. And, and to still encourage you all to ask your questions. So, Suzanne, there's a couple in here for you now. Um, what is the sustainable application of fertilizer per hectare to reduce environmental risk and maintain production? Are you recommending 360 kilograms nitrogen per hectare per year for an intensive system? Um, this is, well, some, it's very farm specific. So, so from, some farms may need that for the their stocking rate, the number of amount of grass they need to produce. So it is very farm specific. That would be absolutely the upper limit. Okay. So like for, so for those extensive farmers where they're putting on under a hundred kilograms, that's, that produces enough grass for them that they need. So it's really depending on the system and how much, you know, you need. So do you foresee a day when, you know, there's a, a, a more granular level of banding around the systems and the amount of fertilizer that's needed for those systems? As yes. As the, the yeah. blanket piece we use at the minute. Yes, ideally it should be banded because the more intensive guys need the higher amount of nutrients, otherwise they could end up in deficiencies. But as you see, that'll be that's excess for the lower intensity extensive farms, and that's that's what's contributing to our environmental problems. So they're putting on nutrient that's not actually needed, and it's wasting their money, um, and it's also impacting on the environment. Okay, and what do you, would you foresee as the risks in that kind of an approach, the unintended consequences potentially? Of putting on too much, but of, of banding, you know, of, of putting in a banded system as opposed to the blanket system that we currently have. Well, I think it's, I think that's, that's actually more beneficial for farmers. So they, it would be based on their nitrogen inputs then that they would know those farmers are already operating at that intensity. So they would just know how much phosphorus they need, how much of other nutrients they need, and they they don't need to put on any more nitrogen unless if, if they don't need it. And it would save them money and um, I think it's, it's a more sort of beneficial approach. So it's really pre precision farming but, across yes. the region. Yes. Um, so you state that low chemical nitrogen fertilizer systems require lower P levels, but sometimes these systems may get nitrogen from clover. Could you maybe comment on the interaction, you know, that if there was clover based swords out there, what would be a reasonable level of phosphorus to apply? Um, well, we haven't actually we haven't actually done that. Looked with clover in in the system yet, but you would assert if more nitrogen, um, that would obviously increase their nitrogen input. But then, so then they could the grass if the grass was growing more, it would take up more phosphorus. But it probably it still wouldn't need more than an index two minus likely for an extensive or two plus. You wouldn't be going above. The two plus for phosphorus. Okay, uh, and there's there's a couple of questions in here that are angling towards um, the microbiome of the soil. So uh, apologies if we're, we're stretching um, the boundaries here, Suzanne. And maybe if anybody else wants to contribute, but what um, could you comment on? You know how the microbiome could potentially impact on phosphorus breakdown in the soil. Maybe you know slurry management. You know how. What role can the microbiome play here in helping nutrient availability to plants, as well as reducing the environmental impact? Okay, so um, all nutrient uptake in soil is facilitated by the microbiome. So in your organic sources of nutrients, say slurry or the organic matter, it's the microbiome that actually the microbiology of the, the biology of the soil that releases those nutrients and transforms them into a form that the grass can actually take up. So you really need to promote a healthy soil biology. Um, so your pH is critical for that. So a lot of these um, organisms in the soil operate at a specific pH. 
Um, so for grassland, it's around 6, 6.2. So when your soil pH is right, the functioning, the functioning of the biology of the soil is optimum. So then you're going, that's going to help release phosphorus from organic material um, and help the, the grass to then take it up. So it's going to make better use of your nutrients. So the whole, um, it's critically important. If your biology isn't functioning right, there could be nutrients in the soil, but the grass actually can't take it up. So it's a bit like a healthy gut. Yes. A healthy soil, the microbiome has a key role to play. And yeah. Suzanne, could you comment as well, you know, we focus a lot on grassland soils. You know, how does that talk across to arable soils and, and the arable industry? Well, okay, so the ar arable system is slightly different because you have a crop, arable crops take up a lot of phosphorus in their period of growth. So generally arable soils wouldn't be building up phosphorus to the extent that grassland would. So whenever you grow um, an arable crop, it takes up a lot, so the phosphorus drops a lot quicker in an arable system. So it tends not to build up. An arable system also do not get the slurry applications that a grassland would. So their phosphorus tends not to be building up to excessive levels that you would have in a grassland system. But it's still for an arable system, then you're looking at the agronomic optimum for phosphorus. So you definitely would need to be in an index two for phosphorus, the upper end, to make sure you meet your requirements of your crop. And just I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend going down to an index one for an arable crop and it needs the phosphorus. Yeah, so and just to maybe follow on a little bit, one your last question here for you, Suzanne. Um, rather than stop applying P for a longer period of time, is there potential actually to change the crop type to help bring down the P index quicker? Yes, so we are hoping to actually look at this. So where there's different black, um, grass species you can apply um, or, or sow that have deeper rooting systems. So a lot of that phosphorus is, so, is stored deep down in the soil and the grass actually can't get at it. So if you um, change the species you, you're planting, then um, gra different grasses can extract that phosphorus quicker and help um, mine up the phosphorus that's stored in the soil. So we're hoping to look at that. Yeah, and, and indeed arable would mine the soil of phosphorus quicker as well, your, your, yes. your barleys. Yes, with deeper rooting systems, yeah. Okay, thank you, Suzanne. We, just for the sake of time now, we'll move on to Rachel. So Rachel Cassidy um, has equally excellent soil scientist within AFBI, and Rachel's worked a lot on linking up some his water quality work to the catchment sciences. So. Rachel, over to you. Thank you. Hi. Well, hello. Um, uh, I suppose is that working? Okay. Um, well, my research is focused on water quality and on understanding and mitigating the impacts of agriculture on our surface and groundwaters. Um, and this is particularly focused on diffuse contaminants, whether that's pesticides, uh, nutrients, sediment, or, or other emerging issues for fresh water. Um, measures to protect uh, water bodies uh, under the, the Nutrient Action Programme are by necessity blanket measures that applied equally to all farms. And I suppose we are at a point now where water quality is declining and the evidence is pointing towards the need for more targeted measurement measures and to recognise that all farms are unique. Um, you can have two identical uh, farm operations, same area of land, same field use, same number of livestock, um, same operations being undertaken on the same day each year, but dependent on the landscape, the soil and, and climatic factors that, and the proximity to the water bodies, uh, the impact can be com completely and, and starkly different. Um, so that's where we need to move to. Northern Ireland has an incredibly diverse landscape um, with a, a complex geology that's been eroded and deposited and repeated glaciations over the last few million years to give us the topography we have today. And built upon that topography are our soils. And the reason so many of them are poorly drained is because of that glacial origin and a very high clay content. Um, 58% have very impeded drainage and, and uh, over 80% are, are, are impeded in some form. And that affects agriculture. 
and the, the agri agricultural systems that can be carried out in different areas. Um, drainage is one factor. The other is the mineralogy of the soil, um, determining how well phosphorus, for example, is bound to the soil and how easily it's released on exposure to water. So all these factors need to be incorporated when we are considering managing agriculture, both in terms of profitability, but also in terms of water protection. Um, and the proximity of our, our farms to, to drains, uh, streams and, and rivers determines how quickly and the pathways that, that, that uh, nutrients and other contaminants take. But built on adding to the problem uh, is the change in climate. I've just pulled out here some of our um, the river flow data for four of our uh, catchment research platforms that we're currently working in, in Upper Ban, Ballanderry, uh, the Derg and Colebrook. And I got the total annual flow per, uh, for the period 1970 to present. And although there's a lot of interannual variation, what is clear across all of the um, all of the, the catchments is that the amount of water coming down the rivers each year is generally rising. So that's more water and more potential to, to move um, uh, towards uh, the, the water bodies. Additionally, we're getting more extreme rainfall events. This is data from our Ma rain gauge um, from 1970 to present. And I counted the days with more than 10 millimetres of rain per year. And to fit in a trend line to that again, you see that it is there is a, an increase over the last 50 years. Um, and this more intense rainfall has increased erosional potential and is less likely to be rapidly able, the ground is less likely to uh, soak it up, but it'll be translated to runoff. So there's those issues regarding rainfall. We also have the climate projections, which are um, projecting that we will have longer dry periods in future. And I think we got a taste of that in the summer of 2018 uh, with the drought. And so this is data from our uh, upper band monitoring catchments. There are 13 sub catchments that we monitor on a fortnightly basis. And this is data from the start of 2018 to the start of 2020. Um, and the concentrations of total oxidized nitrogen, that's nitrate plus nitrite uh, uh, through time. So during the drought in 2018, the soil moisture deficit here, the blue line, dropped to 100 millimetres. That's the amount of water you need to add to bring it back up to field capacity and is exceptionally dry. The subsequent winter, what we see is uh, across all catchments, an elevated concentration of, of nitrogen, even in the ones in the headwaters that have very low uh, agricultural activity and the ones that are intensively managed lost the most. So this plume and, and pulse, pulsing of nitrogen back into the, the water system occurred and was elevated up until a Feb or May or June 2019. And then we had a normal wet summer in 2019 and a normal winter where the concentrations went back down to what we're accustomed to see. Our interpretation of this is that the catchments became so dry in 2018 and there was no flow over a period in, in some of the rivers and the soil and the catchment dried out so that there was no anaerobic um, denitrification occurring, which normally in these clay soils acts to convert the nitrogen to gaseous um, rather than, uh, than allowing it to um, go down into groundwater. This didn't happen. We saw peaks in our groundwater monitoring as well over the period. It, it seems then that the nitrogen that got to groundwater uh, was slowly released through winter. So this going forward is something we need to um, focus our research a bit more on. We're very phosphorus focused, which is important as it is the, the main, main issue in most of our water bodies. But we need to keep an eye on the climate factors and, and, and on nitrogen going forward. So I suppose in terms of developing mitigation, we need to understand and incorporate landscape and soil factors and develop customised approaches for each farm. If we are to try and reverse the decline, blanket measures have limited effectiveness because of the differences among farms. We need to build in climate resilience. And again, as, as Donica and Suzanne mentioned, we need to target measures in the right place and at the right time.
and achieving this is going to require advanced information and decision support. A step in the, the right direction with this have been the soil pilot schemes that AFP have been involved in over the last few years, funded by DERA and by the European Union as Exceptional Adjustment Aid Package to Northern Ireland. And this allowed the largest scale soil sampling that's been undertaken here or, or uh, uh, anywhere else, as far as we can find out. Um, and the work was focused on sampling in an NI wide scheme, but also focused on the sub catchments of Colebrook, Upper Ban, and Strule, where we aim to maximise uptake in specific sub catchments in those areas. Overall, the soil pilot scheme sampled over 1,600 farms for soil. Over 30,000, almost 30,000 fields were sampled, and almost 800 farmers were trained by CAFRI. And, and this was a collaboration between Ulster University, the UFU, CAFRI, ourselves, and DERA throughout. Um, an important element of what we delivered were map based uh, results rather than tabulated results to farmers, the farmers received maps of pH, of lime, of um, phosphorus and, and potash requirements. And also for the first time in the Colebrook and Upper Band catchments, we were able to bring in these landscape and soil factors through a hydrological model and, and producing risk maps to show runoff risk areas within the catchments. We learned a lot through these uh, programmes of work. Uh, lime deficiencies was a, a big one. Um, most soils in Northern Ireland were de de deficient in lime. That's underperforming grassland that's failing to make use of the nutrients that are available to produce dry matter. And John's done the calculations and to correct that lime would result in a five-fold return in terms of grass production. And that grass production, when we hear of the, the soil pea surplus that uh, Donica and Susanna have referred to, would go some way to cotton the imports of fo concentrate phosphorus that we bring into Northern Ireland each year. Um, on the pea surplus, around 40% of the fields in each catchment uh, were above the agronomic optimum of 2+. Plus. Um, and if that's not being used by plants, it's available for loss to water. And there are strong relationships between the, the Olsen P concentration in the soil and the concentration observed in water courses. The nutrient imbalance across farms uh, was suspected but was demonstrated using these data. Here for 160 farms um, that are more than 20 hectares in size, we looked at the distance from the farmyard out to each field and looked at the Olsen P concentrations. And you can see that those fields closest to the farm here tend to be on the receiving end of nutrient applications. So um, that, that was good to have confirmation of, of that. And above all, it highlights that farmers cannot manage nutrients if they don't know, uh, if they don't have the information. I mentioned the hydrological risk mapping. Well, this involves uh, LIDAR scans of both the Upper Ban and the Colebrook catchment to provide uh, sub-meter digital elevation models of, of, of the topography. This was used to model uh, overland flow pathways. To temper this according to the soil permeability, the, the model included a parameter to adjust for permeability so that a high permeability soil will produce less runoff potential than a low permeability soil. And this is the raw, the raw data for this on the right, where you have a drumlin with a yard on top of the hill, uh, 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 a stream flowing at the bottom of the slope. And these are the, the runoff pathways. Yellow and red areas are those areas at higher risk of developing runoff and accumulating flow um, than the, the other areas. And they show the, the places where that, that, that runoff enters the stream. And these are targets, places we should be focusing on when we're implementing, for example, environmental farming scheme, riparian buffers, and other new and developing uh, technologies um, to retain nutrients and bring them back onto the land rather than releasing them to water. Uh, this is an example of the farm scale risk maps that the farmers received. Uh, each field has, uh, has a colour and a value. Um, 
the yellow risk areas are those where if you apply manure or nutrients or a chemical fertilizer within those areas, there is a high risk of loss if there's rainfall. Where those risk areas are red, that's where the field has an underlying high uh, Olson P concentration. And that, as well as any applied nutrients, is at risk of, of mobilization. Again, we focused on informing the farmers on the delivery points where they should be considering uh, taking additional uh, precautions. Um, we've looked through through the data um, at catchment scale at, at the opportunities to redistribute nutrients away from areas of, of high soil P into those areas that are below optimum and, and maybe uh, in intensive systems aren't producing the, the, the grass that they could be. Um, but of course, we have to do that mindful of minimising any runoff risk. Um, in these yellow areas, you would have to exercise extreme caution in applying any uh, manure or slurry. Um, and, and it would have to be very dry conditions, especially here along, along the, the, the river network. So we made up rules to evaluate this at farm and catchment scale. Our rules were that a block would need to be 0.2 uh, hectares in area at least to for, to to, to, to um, be compatible with what a slurry tank could spread, include a five metre buffer around any infield risk area, and the field shouldn't be extensive. We're not uh, proposing that extensive fields uh, become targets for uh, re redistribution. On this farm, uh, the, 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 the striped areas are where you could consider redistributing nutrients to, bringing in those precision technologies that, that Suzanne mentioned. And when we look at this at farm scale and then within catchments, providing there were the logistical issues were dealt with and there was some way of transporting nutrients between farms, there is a limited opportunity to deal with some of the surplus through nutrient redistribution. But overall, opportunity areas are not enough to manage the surplus. So reduction of in input uh, is, is going to be essential. Uh, a very important uh, finding that came out of this research was the relationship to water quality. Because we worked at catchment scale, we have fortnightly monitoring data for all the catchments that were involved in the study in Coldbrook and Upper Ban, and we're able to compare the in-stream concentrations with the, the soil status and the, the risk status of the catchment overall. So we took the proportion of the catchment that's above the optimum soil test P, and that is this, this under the the, the the assumption that that phosphorus is available for loss and it is backed up by many studies and we took then the median SRP concentration during the period in the year that the soil sampling uh, was undertaken and what we've got is a very strong linear relationship first for the upper band red triangles and then also when we brought the Colebrook data in the model is um extremely good fit. When we put um, the, the the threshold boundary conditions for those uh, subcatchments on top of that, so that's this uh, coloured uh, horizontal line between good and moderate water quality status. It varies uh, for each catchment based on alkalinity and altitude. Um, we This indicates that a threshold for these catchments to avoid eutrophication should be to have no more than between 15 and, and maybe 20% of the catchment above optimum for soil test P. So that is allowing us to state a carrying capacity for those catchments and, 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 and set targets. There are outliers, two outliers for Upper Ban and two for Colebrook, and these seem with sparse data to be um, forming a, a separate uh, distribution. And we need to look at that. These uh, rivers are ones that are very heavily channelised and have thick deposits of sediment, which may be retaining P for a massive pulse in a, in a storm event. So the, the, the differences between catchments and between um, the, the structure of the drainage network need to be uh, worked looked at more fully. And this is work that we've currently got a PhD student between Ulster University, Phil Jordan and, and myself um, over the next four years funded by DARA. Um, we look as well at the 
the relationship of water quality to risk as well as high soil P. When we plot those areas above optimum soil test P with high runoff risk against the median and stream soluble reactive phosphorus concentration, we again get a very strong model, but it's a power model, and that reflects the complexity of the structure of the runoff pathways. Um, when we use that model to assess the threshold for a risk to eutrophication by applying the moderate to good uh, water quality limits again, this time just for upper ban, we find that really you can't have more than one, one and a half percent of the catchment ab above optimum soil test P and at high runoff risk if you want to, uh, to avoid uh, water quality issues. So that's another target. Either you um, reduce soil P in those fields or you put in some form of an interception measure to retain phosphorus and bring it back uh, onto the land. Interestingly for Colebrook, when we, when we plot the same data, the distribution is, is different. It seems that uh, there can be a higher uh, carrying capacity for high risk areas before you start to see a water quality impact. But I will um, highlight that this is a model with very few data points and that it's work that we need to continue. All catchments will have, our, with different landscapes, should, we are expecting that there will be different relationships. So they're going to be very catchment specific. But how can we use this information? Well, we, we can use those relationships to water quality to set catchment specific water quality targets. So as an example for the upper band 13 sub catchments, we can say that we need no more than 15% of those catchments above optimum soil test P collectively across farms. And that we should try and eliminate areas that have high runoff risk or above. Uh, optimum soil test P through either targeted intervention interception measures or bringing down the, the phosphorus in those fields and, and really restricting the nutrient applications. On a farm scale, the mapped base approach allows farmers to see um, across their farms, every farmer knows where the wet areas in a specific field are, but to look at the farm uh, whole, as a whole is, is vitally important. You can then prioritise areas for mitigation and, and intervention, depending on budget. You can look at redistributing nutrients from the red fields to these um, areas that are below optimum and pose little risk to water quality. We can take this farm scale information and look within the catchment collectively as part of a, a group scheme where farmers can um, work together to decide how they could bring for this upper band catchment with 45% of its area above optimum soil test P, what opportunities exist within the catchment to bring those levels down to 15% and reduce uh, the area at high risk as well uh, to below one. And, and nutrient transfers between farms um, is going to be an important step in doing this and obviously we have issues with biosecurity and logistics that need to, to be developed to deal with this if it's going to be possible. But collectively these approaches integrating uh, soil and landscape and, 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 and um, risk data can be brought into decision support for farmers and should be. Incorporation of spatial data is, is going to be um, essential going forward. So I suppose um, my take home messages from this are that we need, if we are to try and reverse the decline in, in water quality, uh, we need to move to targeted measures rather than blanket approaches. These need to be landscape and soil specific and start to consider more climate resilience. Um, the soil pilot schemes, these large scale soil and risk mapping programmes have demonstrated that they will enable management from field to farm to catchment scale if we can implement them. Um, and key is that this knowledge is transferred to farmers. Um, that's crucial in empowering them to make decisions on on-farm management and maximising the profitability, but also in educating them as to how their activities impact water quality. And this, this carrot um, incentive approach of empowerment is to be preferred over enforcement, I think. So that's all. If you have any questions, I'll hand back to Elizabeth. 
Thank you very much, Rachel. That was very interesting. I'll maybe just pick up on your last comment there around the empowerment of farmers. Would you like to comment on how the upper band catchment is is working through? Because you, you guys are working very closely with farmers in this general concept as a pilot piece there. Yeah, well, we, we did. I mean, there have there has been a lot of work undertaken in the upper band catchment since the, the soil pilot and, and our monitoring programs have been rolled out. Uh, Leeds University did a behavioural change study after the, the soil pilot leak scheme ended and the overwhelming feedback from that was that farmers uh, really liked the, the way that the information was presented to them. It was causing them to consider the impact of their activities on, on water quality and it was um, uh, encouraging them to, towards better nutrient management practices and consider how their farm profits are being affected. So that's that's been one good outcome, I think, and encouraging in terms of that farmers will get engaged. Um, the other work at the moment we're doing there is uh, rolling out a group environmental farming scheme um, in, in one of the upper band catchments where we're trying to get as many farmers as possible to target uh, the measures under that um, based on the runoff risk and, and soil maps. So that's ongoing at the moment and, and it will be time before we get results from that. But I think it's a positive step and it's built around the Rivers Trust will undertake engagement activities and education with the farmers in those catchments. And they're it's it's po the farm the farmers we've spoken to so far are positive and want this information. Thank you, Rachel. So we've got a question here around soil permeability. If we have soil permeability maps that show high soil soil permeability, could we produce a risk map for nitrogen losses as well? Yes, and in, in a in a very quick quick answer to that, I think we can. But it is it is complex. Um, the run the topographic maps allow us to see sinks in the landscape where they're likely to become water logged and where denitrification is is likely to occur. Um, when we have permeability and very freely draining soils, it's more much more likely that that nitrate will get down and into groundwater. And you see the effect from the the data. Uh, presented on, you know, as soil dries out, um, how the the denitrification doesn't happen, and and it does go down into groundwater. So I think we could produce a risk map, but it, it's a it will be a, ma a major piece of research. But I mean, the the information is is there to try and start developing that. Sure. I've got one more question for you, Rachel, and, and maybe if others can put their cameras back on, because we're going to move to the panel discussion just after this quick question for Rachel. A lot of your your maps are based on lidar mapping. You know how impactful could a lidar map of Northern Ireland be? Um, very. <laughs> I, it's it's. I mean, for what what I do, it's it, it's just, it's essential. It allows it. It would allow us to work in catchments across Northern Ireland. Um, it 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 gives you. A high resolution data does, you know, allows you to go down to sub field levels. You can provide information with, you know, at that scale. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think it's, a, it's essential if we're to try and roll out and develop on from the, the soil pilot schemes. Okay, thank you. It's a good investment. Thank you. John, a bit of a there's a couple of questions in here around land management, and I suppose that the piece is: is there not a larger and wider land use issue here? You know, there's an imbalance. The amount of phosphorus we're bringing in, the amount of the intensive in fact we're feeding, um, feeding that to our intensive livestock, um, across dairy, pigs, and poultry. You know, whilst we're not growing it ourselves, is there something about reallocating crop type across Northern Ireland to actually rebalance, you know, what we're bringing in and what we do here using our land. Up from you, Elizabeth. Yes, please. Well, yes, that would be potentially be good. I think it's just as Rachel, I think maybe had said earlier on, or maybe it was um, Donick as well, um, the, the rainforest situation in the country and the soils themselves don't lend themselves totally to arable production. Yes, going back in time during the war, we did have much more arable land, but at the moment, you know, it's it's more difficult to to grow the crops. For instance, forage maize really is only in the east of the province really. We can actually use 
the land for forage maize because they don't get the growing season. It's too short, really, or just the, the land wets up too quickly towards the, the centre in the west of the island. So it would be really good if they could bring in crops that we could use, you know, to produce animal feeds, you know, and arable feeds. But the climate is a big issue, and also the soils. There's so many and very impeded drainage. Mm -hmm. And I'm aware from, you know, just our Cross Nacrevy team, they are looking at um, crops such as rye, and even there's discussions at the minute around hemp, etc. So, you know, I think it's an area to explore, but it could be challenging, is what I'm hearing. Yes, could be. Chris, maybe over to yourself. And um, there's a couple of questions that have come in around, um, you're dealing with the phosphorus before it gets to the land, and even, um, is there other separation techniques out there? What would we do with the phosphorus whenever it we actually get it out of the slurry so that it, we avoid it coming back into the agricultural um, sphere? And, and the third question here is, you know, how effective can hedgerows, willow strips, trees, how effective are those at actually mitigating phosphorus going into the waterways? So three part <laughs> question for you there. Sorry, Chris, I'll try and keep you right. <laughs> no, I should have been I should have been writing down the question. Um, but I think I think actually some of it relates to what John just mentioned there as well. You know, if we can't if we can't grow these um, these non grass crops in Northern Ireland, then you know there is a circular economy aspect. We can we can send this nutrient back to the countries that actually do grow that crop in the first place. So that that is one aspect. So then it comes to the middle bit of your question, I think, which was, you know, what else can we do with these these organic wastes, these slurries, or increasingly probably these digestates? And I think, again, we come much more into a circular economy. It's about energy recovery as much as anything else. So <clears throat> put as much of that carbon out as we possibly can. Yes, we can separate, we can screw, screw press, we can centrifuge, we can use other techniques, we can use uh, methods to remove uh, nitrogen at source, evaporation to remove ammonia, we can use daft separation, flocculation, sedimentation. There's lots of different technologies which the water industry, of course, have been practicing for many, many decades um, in order to uh, pull as much of that nutrient away and as much of that pollution away from their discharges. So bringing all these, bringing all these technologies together, <clears throat> there are solutions that we can indeed remove these nutrients um, and, and try to develop a circular economy. New EU rules will probably mean that more organic phosphorus, for example, will start to be contributed to fertilizers which are used across the across the Europe, um, maybe even further. Um, and there's some real options for removing for removing nutrient, for removing phosphorus, um, and actually having developed markets for them. So struvites, biochars, even ashes. So then we come on to well, what thermochemical treatment technologies are there? And you know, we have some some EU projects which are working on exactly that, looking at the potential energy that could be derived from these materials before that nutrient then is further processed. And if we look at the amount of slurry in Northern Ireland, the amount of digestate in Northern Ireland, just on a on a on a kilowatt hour basis, it is actually quite significant. It could be 15 to 20 percent of Northern Ireland's heat load, for example, which could have a value, um, you know, 100 million. Those are just some figures um, which have plucked off the top of my head. But it's a significant amount of of, um, of organic waste, which could indeed have have a many other many other uses um, in terms of a circular economy. And then I think flicking to the third bit of your question here, yes, as you know, we've been we've been doing some work on on you know fast growing woody tree species. How well can they operate as you know point source receptors for nutrient? But even diffuse um, uh, receptors for nutrient as well, and such as the you know the lidar maps which Rachel showed earlier with the digital train modelling. You know, is it an opportunity to actually actually focus some of these um, some of these crops in order to deal with these outflows? Um, and we've we've been running some work through an EU project and more latterly um, funded to, uh, over the last year by by DERA. Um, and yes, we do seem to be at an early stage. However, I need to rephrase that at a very early stage. We see, do seem to be getting a, a, an improvement in the amount of phosphorus, especially particular phosphorus that is that is running out um, into overland flow catchments. Now it's it's early stage, but common sense says it would happen and it should happen. Um, and we we seem to be getting some data in that in that basis. But, you know, going forward, I think we can probably tighten up on that data. So hopefully I've dealt with uh, parts of those questions, Elizabeth. Yeah. And folks, you know, if we haven't got round to answering some of your questions, we will follow up. Um, there's a last question in here, Don, who I'm going to send to you because I think you can wrap it into your wrap up comments, please. Um, is there an alternative to the close period and what could be the unintended consequences? So. You know, can you comment very briefly on that? Because we are at 12 o'clock and, and maybe okay. some wrap up comments wrapped in. 
Okay, so uh, there there is a, there is obviously a, a alternative to closed period um, um, where we base our slurry applications around um, high precision um, rainfall data and soil moisture data on a field scale, um, and that that is is you know theoretically that is possible. There's no doubt about that. But the unintended consequences could be that you may have to you have tighter restrictions in terms of the the thresholds that with you uh, which you apply. Slurry. So, for example, you may restrict slurry applications to, to zero millimeters so much a deficit if farmers had the information to make that decision. The unintended consequences of that would be that they would actually be overall throughout the whole year to be less days available to farmers for spreading slurry if you were very if you had very tight restrictions on, on so much a deficit overall compared to the current situation, you even though you're lengthening the close period, you will probably end up having less time available um, to, to, to farmers for spreading slurry. Um, the, the the whole issue around cost effectiveness and cost evaluation of all that does need to be considered because the investment in this sort of data is is you know is costly. Um, so it, 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 there is a way, but Northern Ireland really needs to move towards you know high resolution data. So I suppose that kind of answers that question. There is a way, but it means investment and work to get there, um, and we're in, in, in no position to do it at this point in time. I feel. Um, Any so final wrap up comments then? Don't have for today. Well, I suppose I think in the um, we've definitely seen really good improvements in water quality in Northern Ireland in the last twenty years, um, and you know that's credit to all farmers and all the the industry <coughs> working hard and improving nutrient management and other um, and other issues. Um, but unfortunately, we do need to make take further steps. There's no doubt about that. In, in the current data, we need to take further steps to improve water quality. Um, and the key to nutrient um, to the nutrient issue. Is not a new is not a new message. It's it's around right time, right place. <clears throat> but we do need to take a step up. We need to take a step up in terms of how we do that. And Rachel's presentation highlighting the need for high resolution data around you know topography, around soils, around you know the, the um, uh, uh, Suzanne's presentation highlighting the need for precision nutrient management. You know, all that requires an investment in data, high resolution rainfall data, high resolution soil data, high resolution topography data. So that needs to really be tackled if we're going to do it. Um, but the big issue that needs to be addressed is the amount of slurry we have in our system. Um, even if we have all those um, that data in place, we still have a significant surplus. So it needs to be significant, you know, really rapid steps taken to addressing the issue of the surplus of phosphorus in, in our system if we are going to achieve the targets that we have set out for ourselves in the water framework directive or its, or its replacement. Okay. Thank you, John Hu, very much. And, and folks, that will conclude today's uh, webinar. And I say this is the first in a series of the Soil to the Sea webinars. So today we very much focused on the agricultural and the slurry impact on, um, on land use and nutrients of soil. Next week, um, same time, same place, um, we will be looking at the impacts of the environment, nutrient loading and other human pressure on the actual ecology of rivers and lakes and life within those rivers and lakes. And the presenters there will be Dr. Robert Rosell, Dr. Richard Kennedy, and Dr. Maria Snell. So they very much look at, at you know, inland waterway, ecology, and fish life, et cetera. And we'll be relating that back to the agricultural practices. And then the third webinar, will take it further out to the sea, out to our coastal areas and our sea. So I hope you've enjoyed today. And uh, please do register for next week and the following week if you haven't already. And uh, for now, have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.